Now you'll have sound with that full screen. How's that? Is that good? Okay, just check with them. Okay, great. To understand being, we need to use something other than our intellect, our mind, other than beliefs. We need to use our consciousness, which, simply stated, is awareness. Awareness is something that doesn't think. It simply perceives. All of us have that. But our awareness has become conditioned, habituated to thinking and to emotions and beliefs, theories, structures, concepts, boxes, in other words. To understand being, we need to remove those cages from our awareness. Meaning, we simply need to open our awareness to look beyond the limitations that we have adopted, like concepts. Let's say, for example, this concept of God. Anyone can experience the truth about what God is. But people do not because their mind doesn't allow it. That's us. We have veils in front of our awareness, filters. You could say shields, like defense mechanisms. We adopt beliefs and ideas and theories to give us a sense of security, to make us feel like we know something, to make us feel like our life is headed somewhere and that some deity in the heavens loves us. We don't really know. Our word being, our word to be in English is similar to most of the other languages in the Western Hemisphere. It has a root in an ancient language that is closely related with Sanskrit. So our word in English, to be, or being, is actually from this word, bu, in Sanskrit. We're not here to study etymology or to become experts in exotic languages. We're here to learn about nature and reality and ourselves. And the reason I point this out is because that word conveys a lot of meaning that we don't find in English or in any other modern language. Bu in Sanskrit means be, to be. It also implies becoming. It is also the number one. And that's so because, philosophically speaking, religiously speaking, the first thing that exists is beingness, a state of becoming, a state of potential. In the Asian religions, they have a lot of words for this, a lot of symbols for this. Shunyata, voidness, emptiness, Brahma, Parabrahma, Samantabhadra, Adibuddha. A lot of names, a lot of symbols, all of them point towards one thing, our essential nature. It is a simple unity, the number one. Totally pure, without any characteristics except for being. 
It has no name. It has no time. It doesn't have a beard. It doesn't have a gender. You can call it God if you want, but the name is irrelevant. And the name, unfortunately, brings baggage. That's partly why I like this word, boo. It's unusual. It doesn't have cultural baggage, unless you are a Sanskrit scholar. So when we want to understand our genuine nature and where we've come from, why we exist, this is the ultimate, deepest part of us, simple beingness. We also describe this as the absolute. It is a indescribable aspect of existence. You could say non-existence. It is a state of absolute happiness. Complete and utter joy. And if it has a defining characteristic that our mind could grasp, because emptiness is so vague and strange, you would say it's love. Simple, pure, unmodified, and expansive love. A state of happiness, beingness, that is so simple, our mind can't understand that simplicity. So at some time in the ancient past, that state of beingness expressed itself. It reached out. It became something. It became three. And that's why every religion has a trinity as its base symbol. Three and one. Today, we're not going to talk about religious symbols. We're not going to talk about all the different symbolic representations of this number and this level of nature. Because our aim is to study ourselves, this level of existence in us. And if we were able to liberate our consciousness to such a degree that we experienced this level, it would have these qualities, freedom, understanding, and wisdom. In Buddhism, they call this the Trikaya. Hindus call this the Trimurti. Three faces, three sides of one thing. But for us, what we need to understand is that one beingness, in order to become, has to work with the law how nature functions, and in every level of nature, for something to be created, to become, it requires three elements. So we call this the law of three. And that's why all the religions use a trinity as a base symbol. And we're using here today a triangle to represent this. Don't expect or assume that this triangle is literal. It is not. We're only looking at it as a geometrical symbol of a living force. It's not a triangle in space. It's just one thing that has three aspects in order for it to become something. One way to understand this is to think of it as forces. the urge to become would be that first force. It's projective. We could say masculine, which is why we often use a masculine God as a symbol. A God means something powerful, a force, masculine. And as soon as that masculine aspect arises, 
it immediately evokes its complement, which is feminine. You cannot have a masculine without a feminine. Impossible. As soon as you talk about one, you have the other, instantly. And as soon as you have those two, you also have that which joins them, the relationship between masculine and feminine. There are your three forces. Freedom, understanding, and wisdom. When we talk about male-female, it's easier for our mind to grasp it. But we're not talking about male and female. We're using male and female as a symbol to help us understand this force. It is a psychological aspect of a subtle level of nature within us. Very deep and very subtle. We all have it. Once that aspect of ourselves emerges, it immediately arises another one. And that next one is also three, within the space of the first three. So now we have some interesting numbers. If that first space of Trinity, the first three, becomes more within it is another three because that three is required for each creation, each form of creation, which means we have two threes now. Three and three, we have six. So you could say it's like a condensation. These forces are condensing, thickening, crystallizing, forming. If you've studied the four worlds of Kabbalah, this is so simple, because that's all we're talking about. How Atzluth and Bria relate. So at this level, we now have six laws. We have the three that are subtle, and another three that are a little less subtle, a little more concrete. And that next three would have these characteristics. Unconditional love, courage, compassion, willpower. Try not to limit your mind to the way the mind interprets these words. These are not human characteristics. These are divine. These are the qualities of gods, Buddhas, angels, if you want. These are the qualities of a type of mind that is incredibly pure, but is starting to develop into something that can act in profound ways. Now, what's important for us to start to grasp here is that as these laws create, things are becoming more complex. You can already see that. We've got a lot of factors now that are in motion. And remember, this is inside of us, deep down inside of us. These are qualities of being that are starting to become more particularized. You see that? They start subtle, empty. When you look at this image, remember, this white space would be that emptiness without attributes, the absolute. That condensed into something to become, which is that first expression of three. And that condensed further to become into another expression of three, which means now we have six laws, like a prism, modifying light. The light that's flowing through this is the light of the absolute, the being, Bu, divinity, if you want, love. And it's modified by these laws into these characteristics. Simple, right? It is. We're not even to the complicated part yet. Because let me, let me ask you, do any of you see yourself here? No, right? Okay, good. That ray, that light, condenses more. So within the space of the first law of three, it condensed a law of three and formed six. And now it condenses again another law of three, and the total of that is 12. 
Now we have 12 laws at play. More condensed, the light is becoming more particularized. Now we find that that is having the quality of humility. What you can start to grasp here is that these very broad, very sort of abstract qualities are starting to become very particularized. Maybe that's not clear to you, but it will if you reflect on it. At this level, you see how much more complex things are. We now have 12 laws. The law of three in levels interlock, but still with a beautiful harmony. If we were to relate this to nature, to levels of life where living beings are, this would be a very high heaven where the law of 12 reigns, where all the beings who live there are marked by their great humility. And above and superior to them are levels of beings in the world of six laws who are even more pure, more simple, more profound. So this isn't complicated. But of course, that light condenses further into the world of 24 laws. And now this subtle complexity has become honesty. And you see how much more complex nature has become. 24 laws. This realm, the world of 24 laws, is the level of heaven that is closest to us. We also call it the astral world. So when that light finally condenses into 48 laws, we have the physical world and our physical body, not our mind. In the ancient past, Humanity, human beings, had physical bodies and a psyche, soul and mind, that resided in the world of 48 laws. This is Adam and Eve of ancient times. This is whatever symbol the religions presented as the primordial humanity that was pure and innocent. Long time ago when humanity was simple, very pure. You can still see this quality of mind, a mind in the level of 48 laws, in the eyes of a baby. Anyone here ever looked in the eyes of a baby? And you see their purity and their innocence and their sweetness, so simple. So much light. That's 48 laws. That level of psyche. More pure than that are the beings that live in those levels above that. So what we've outlined so far are levels of being that are pure and innocent. This isn't us. I know you think it is. It isn't. We love to think we have all of these beautiful qualities up here, but we don't. Not in our daily lives. They're in us, but they're buried, conditioned, trapped. We have all these qualities, but we don't get to use them much. We don't have much experience with them because we've made a lot of mistakes. This level of 48 laws relates to our physical existence, and it relates to our physical body, and it relates to our senses. Our physical body and this physical world related to this law of 48. This is not 48 written laws. It is not 48 descriptive parameters in physics, like gravity or magnetism or electricity. It has nothing to do with that. This is 
48 laws of three, 48 times that that law of three is present here. You see, within the absolute, we have the world of three laws, which created within itself, which made six. And when that law of, added another law of three to create another world, it became 12. And when that world of 12 condensed into another world, it became 24. So if you add these up, 3 plus 6 plus 12 plus 24 plus 3 is 48. It's just laws of three, like a beautiful fabric, woven together. And the result is what we perceive physically through our senses. We perceive the world of 48 laws very hazily, but it's what we experience as having a physical body and being in the physical world. In ancient times, we had a quality of mind that was also in the world of 48 laws, but we lost that. And we lost it because the quality of psyche that relates to that world is non-attachment. And we lost that. We developed attachment and we developed lust and we developed craving, and we developed desire. This means that through our willpower, we took that law of three through our body, through our senses, through our mind, and we created, but we created attachment. We created lust desire, craving. And now our mind is in the world of 96 laws. Our physical body is still in the world of 48 laws. Our mind is not. What does this mean? You can find a few places in the world where the physical environment still has the quality of 48 laws. And these are places where life is very simple. It's not complicated. You generally only find this in very remote places, like rural places where there aren't a lot of people. Remote villages. Remote farms where their life is very simple and time doesn't pressure them the way it does the rest of us. But you'll notice when you go into the cities or places where there are a lot of people, things are very complex. There are so many rules and regulations and laws and behaviors that are expected of us. That's because our mind has descended further and further. There are places on this planet that are so incredibly complicated and violent and dangerous. People are under threat from moment to moment, not knowing if they're going to stay alive for another few minutes. And if they say just the wrong thing, they'll be shot or put in prison and tortured. In the West, we're not aware of that really. Because the degree of degeneration is still deepening here. This list of numbers illustrates mathematically how the law of three becomes increasingly complex as the light flows through our mind. What creates these levels of density is our mind, our quality of mind. What I'm putting before you in simple terms is that this is how you can tell your level of being, your quality of life. 
when we talk about level of being, we're talking about a quality of existence, how someone lives, how they experience being alive. And all of us experience our moment-to-moment -moment existence, not according to our physical circumstances, but according to our psychological circumstances. Our quality of mind determines our quality of being. Our internal state, our internal qualities determine our external experience. When we have a life that is extremely rigid, with no real freedom of movement, but every day we are forced to work, to earn a little money, to pay the bills, to fulfill our responsibilities, and to chase after our desires. And from day to day, we're like a hamster in a wheel, repeating the same behaviors every day, over and over and over, then our level of being is very low. Because our life is ruled by many laws. And we have no freedom. No freedom of movement. No freedom of thought. No freedom to change our circumstances. We are restricted. Nowadays, society is rapidly accelerating the multiplication of the laws of three in deepening ways. Because nowadays, you must agree with the herd. The herd says, we love these types of behaviors. We love it when you are sarcastic and cruel. So you must become sarcastic and cruel. You must mock people, talk bad about them, gossip, tell jokes especially people who don't have our beliefs. We demonize others who disagree with us. That is not the behavior of a being with free will. That is not the behavior of an angel or a Buddha or someone who has freedom of movement psychologically and physically. It is the behavior of someone who's in a cage or a prison who in order to survive that prison must do what the other prisoners are doing, or they will be beaten. So we see that from that attachment, from that lust and desire, all of the qualities of our daily life emerge. Lies and anarchy, gluttony and pride, greed and egotism, anger, tyranny, fanaticism. These are the qualities that we live with daily, psychologically and physically. These are the qualities that our society is most recognized by, the quality of our world. We do not live in a world of harmony and peace, a world that loves truth and that wants to ascend to a superior way of being. Our society loves violence and cruelty and degeneration and celebrates it in every possible way and encourages it in every possible way. And if you don't go along with it, well, they will make you suffer. The most important thing for us to recognize is in our daily experience, when we are suffering, when we're in pain, when our mind is racing in the same circles, angry about our parents, about our debts, about our job, we never stop to question that psychological environment. We never realize that that is our level of being and that we chose it. If we were to take a moment when angry and recognize that that anger 
is a very narrow way of seeing things. It is very selfish, it is violent, and it is very blind. Anger wants to inflict pain. That's it. Anger wants to inflict pain. And if we were to recognize that and remember, wow, anger correlates to the world of 480 laws. It is so restricted. It is so far from divinity. And if we act on it, we make it stronger. All of these qualities, psychological qualities, are like that. We have them all. And the problem we have is that we're not really aware of it. These levels, these qualities, are inside of us. But they are in deep layers in our mind, and we are unaware of them until some circumstance or another just pokes it enough that we feel a little tingle from it, a little presence of it. But most of the time, we're not really aware of it because we have our consciousness asleep. Only when somebody says the wrong thing to us or puts us in a bad situation that provokes something of one of these qualities do we then maybe get a glimpse of it, but we always avoid it. We run away. We justify it. We say, oh, no, 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 I'm a spiritual person. That's because these levels are subconscious. Sub means below underneath. They are also unconscious, meaning without consciousness, meaning that sometimes we act on these and don't even realize that that's what's motivating us. Gluttony. Gluttony is the longing for more. It's not just about food. It's a craving to have more of something. Those who constantly shop, those who constantly look for attention are gluttons. Some of us have a personality that's entirely organized around making sure we're always having somebody paying attention to us. That person's a glutton, but they don't realize it. They're unconscious of that. We also have infraconscious qualities that are so deep, we would never accept that we have it. We would never believe it. Every day, we hear stories now of people killing each other taking a gun to a place, killing a bunch of people. And everyone always says, we never expected this person to do that. Never could imagine they would do that. Why? And the authorities are always looking for some terrestrial cause. All of us have that same potential in us the capacity for extreme violence. All it takes is a crack in our personality. Just the right circumstances for part of our psyche to break and for some of these submerged qualities to come out and take over and cause us to behave in ways that are reprehensible. No one here is innocent. No one on the entire planet. There are hundreds of thousands of young men right now who are committing acts of violence that they would have never believed they were capable of. In Europe, there's a war. People are being killed as we speak. And in other places in the world where acts of violence are being carried out by people who never would have accepted they were capable of it 
But put in just the right circumstances with just the right pressures, they become mass murderers. All of us have the potential to become tyrants, cruel, terrible. Because we have all of these qualities deep in our mind. Our level of being is very low. I know this is a distressing thing because I deal with it every day. It is painful. The purpose of the book that we're discussing today is to give us the tools to change it. The first is to recognize it. Self-observation. Learn to observe your mind. Learn to observe the qualities that are percolating under the surface all the time. If you observe the types of thoughts and feelings and impulses that are flowing through you all the time, you'll start to see some things that are really weird. This is also true if you observe the voices that you hear when you're falling asleep. You'll start to hear these voices that are not your voice, saying things and talking and having conversations. And everybody wonders, what is that? Why do I dream? Why do I have these voices in my head? And when I'm falling asleep, when I'm dreaming, there's all these weird people and weird things. It's all part of us. Those are the contents of our mind. And when you see a thought, let's say, for example, you feel really disappointed in someone, even angry, and the thought is there, even if it's just a flash of a thought to hurt them, this impulse to hit them or to hurt them, you may stop it. But that impulse is proof that you have violence, elements of violence in your mind. And maybe in that moment you were able to restrain it, but there may come a day where you cannot. None of us want to hurt the people we love. None of us really want to hurt anyone until anger takes over, until pride takes over, until tyranny takes over, egotism. So observing ourselves is the most important tool that we need to learn when we begin these studies. How to observe, how to see the facts and not run away from them. To observe them and understand them. And this means to study our mind and where our mind gravitates. Now, this seems overwhelming, but it can be changed. There is a way to change it. And that's why we study meditation. Long time ago, this man that we call the Buddha recognized these things about himself too. He saw suffering. He recognized that people were suffering and he wanted to change it. He did not go out into the world and start telling people what to do. He didn't go, hey, you're making people suffer. Stop doing that. He didn't go try to change anyone else. Instead, he walked away from everything. He renounced everything and began to meditate. Now, remember, when we were talking about the world of 48 laws, the quality of that world is non-attachment. So that's where he began, renunciation. 
He renounced attachment. He withdrew within himself and began to observe. That is why we teach meditation the way that we do. When we tell you to adopt your position and relax, we're really telling you, let go of your body. Don't be attached. Let go of thoughts. Don't be attached. Let go of emotions. Let it all go. Leave it alone. Let it rest. Non-attachment. Renunciation. This is because we want to extract the light from the cage. Here are all those laws lined up. When you sit to meditate, you have all of this within you, but you are unaware of it. Your physical senses only perceive a very narrow range of sensations. And your capacity to observe thought and emotion only perceives a very narrow range of thoughts and emotions. The vast majority of what exists within us is imperceptible to us. If you learn to meditate, you can learn to perceive it all. And the way to do that is to become still. If this is a map of our mind, and when we sit to meditate, we don't see anything, we just feel tension, racing thoughts, surging feelings, darkness. That's our level of being. That's our experience of being. That is what we are experiencing of life, is that state. Where is that here? Hard to tell, right? That's a problem. Start here. World of 48 Laws, this is your body. Non-attachment. Place your body in its position. Relax everything. Do not move. Make everything still. With that deep relaxation, your aim is to become one. The unity. The law from which all of this emerges. But if you're sitting there and you're just feeling angry, frustrated, I can't meditate. This is ridiculous. This is a waste of time. That's anger. You can't meditate because you are trapped in the world of 48 laws by that frustration. That desire to meditate has nothing to do with real meditation. It's down here. What if you are a fanatic about this type of study? You've really adopted some psychological or spiritual idea and it totally limits your way of seeing. So you think, no, 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 this way of meditation is wrong. The way I know is better. My way. The way I learned from so-and-so. That way is good. Nothing else works. That's a fanatic. That person's mind is completely conditioned into a narrow view. And they can't see anything else. Same is true of a skeptic. Someone who believes none of this is real. It's all just nonsense that we invented. They don't accept anything. They don't believe anything. They've conditioned themselves into the world of 576 laws. They've built themselves a nice little cage, and that is their level of being, the skeptic, full of doubt and pain. They can't see anything new. So when you're sitting to meditate, or when you're trying to observe yourself through the course of the day, this is what you want to look at in yourself. Why are you not accessing the higher qualities of being? Why are you not accessing the world of 24 laws or 12 laws or 6 laws? Why are you not accessing the world of the absolute, the state of unity? It is because your consciousness is conditioned. Any one of us can escape that conditioning 
and experience the superior levels of being because they're inside of us. And the way to do it is simple. Renounce this. Renounce it. Don't be attached. Relax. Let it go. Don't think. Let go of beliefs. Let go of the adopted behaviors of some tradition or some movement. Let it go. Renounce it. Learn to be. Learn to just be. Be pure awareness, nothing else. No mind, no thought, no emotion, no identity, no name, no religion. That's it. If you can extract your consciousness from this, it will rise out. What keeps it trapped is your will. So if you want to experience superior level of being, it's up to you. You can do that. That's why when we sit to meditate or when we're observing ourselves, we're not trying to make meditation happen. We're not longing for meditation and reaching for it. The cage is still holding us down. First, let go of the cage. Recognize what is preventing you from feeling freedom and peace. Peace only exists in the worlds above, the levels of being that are above. Very simple worlds. Very simple layers of the law of three. The higher you go into the simpler worlds, the more peace you will find. We don't have peace now because our consciousness is trapped in all of these qualities. We don't have serenity. We have pain, conflict. This is why meditation is so important. Real meditation has nothing to do with beliefs, not even theories. It has everything to do with paying attention inside. And each thought that emerges, each impulse, each emotion, each memory, each image, we observe that, we are aware of that, and we let it go. We have to see it, we have to recognize it, but not be attached to it. We need to be honest. We need to be humble. You see, within us, all of us, we have that state of unity, the law of one. Our awareness is rooted in that. The method to meditate is to simply become that, pure awareness, without any conditioning. If you want to experience the absolute, you can do it today. Simply let go of everything that is not that. And that's why in some traditions of meditation, they use exactly that as their method. One particular is coming in my mind. It's the mantra, woo, which we teach. It comes from Chan Buddhism, form of Mahayana Buddhism. That word is Chinese. I'm probably pronouncing it completely wrong. But it means not that. And its purpose, its function, is to build a presence of awareness by extracting awareness from everything, by recognizing, I'm not that, I'm not that, I'm not that, I'm not that, and withdrawing all of our force and power, all of our presence and our awareness into that awareness. Simple. In some traditions, they call this the methodless method, particularly tantric Buddhism, in which they simply say, just be the awareness. Anything else, let it go, like clouds. 
So your level of being is up to you. You can learn to do this in meditation, to experience any of these superior levels of being, to experience the absolute. The problem is, after that experience, your consciousness will go right back into these cages because they belong to you. Liberation, permanent liberation, is only possible when all of these cages are destroyed. The only way to destroy them is to know them, to recognize them. For that, we need to study ourselves. Any questions? Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. So, normal common understanding of treason is uh, to do something that, that goes against the, uh, the will of the state. So I'm, uh, that's not what it means here. Um, do you want to say anything about what treason is in, in this context? Well, this is a good question. These qualities that are outlined here in relation with these laws only present a kind of theme, a kind of flavor. It is interesting that the lowest level, most dense and complex, you could say the worst of all qualities, is treason. And you're right, it has nothing to do with the state or government. It is a treason against oneself. When we commit all these mistakes, attachment, lust, desire, lies, gluttony, greed, every one of those mistakes is a treason against ourselves, a betrayal of our true nature. And as those acts compound upon each other, and propagate further acts that are mistaken, we accumulate a vast debt. You could say, if you can imagine, um, like when something explodes, you have a core of that explosion, but you have many parts that, ev- that emerge out from that and that scatter, and there's a big impact in the environment. You can say it's similar with all of these acts. Lust, for example. To act on lust is not a simple one-to-one equation. We know one of the fundamental laws of karma is the effects of an action are always greater than the cause. When we act in a mistaken way, we produce enormous consequences. And the density of this vast range of mistaken actions produces an incredible array of complicated consequences, which creates a dense movement of treason. It's like the trajectory of our life and our previous existence and our previous existence and our previous existence is rolling a big ball of heavy material down a mountain. And as it rolls, it's just destroying and destroying and destroying. It's like that in subtle levels of nature. And at the bottom, the densest, the hardest, the most painful part is the way we betrayed ourselves and all of that. That's what treason is. It's a terrible debt. These are very interesting to study. And if you're wondering where these qualities are outlined and where you can learn more, I'm going to recommend two books to you. The Writings of Dante, The Divine Comedy, the book Inferno. This is all explained there. People think that was just a poem he wrote. It contains truth. And of course, Samuel Ambior wrote an explanation of the Inferno in his book, Hell, Devil, and Karma. So you can study these 
in detail there and understand what they mean, what they imply, and why they're important to us, why we need to study them. More questions? Yes, sir. Okay. Right. So it's true. Violence is here twice. 192 laws, and then violence against nature in the 672 laws. Well, this is the problem with English. In really, any language, we, we hear a word and we think it has a narrow meaning, but these words have a broad meaning, very broad. Truthfully, every level from 96 to 864 is violence, every one of them. Treason is violence, violence against ourselves, against our innermost. Fanaticism is violence against ourselves and others. Well, all of them are. But when we think about it particularized in the world of 192 laws, this would be the sort of common violence that we think about, hurting people. the way anger expresses itself, or the way we want to conquer others or trample, climb over others to get what we want. That's that type of violence. It doesn't necessarily mean physical violence. It, it does imply that, but it's mostly psychological. So as an example, sarcasm. That's mental violence. The way we mock people, even our friends, like we tell jokes, and we cut each other, you know, say things like cut each other down and ridicule each other and mock each other as a joke, as to be funny. But psychologically, it's violence. We're actually hurting each other. It's just underneath. So you, that kind of joking around is actually bad, harmful. Violence against nature in the world of 672 laws has to do with how we abuse our bodies, how we abuse each other, particularly sexually. But it also has to do with any other kind of violence against the natural functions of nature, how nature should be working. And there's too many to list. We're destroying this planet and destroying ourselves and destroying each other. All of that relates to this, violence against nature. But the most important of the forms of violence against nature are all those forms that prevent souls from entering the path. For example, when we could help someone find the path out of suffering, and we don't. That's bad. If we have the key to escape suffering and somebody's looking for it and we don't give it to them, that's violence against nature. It's violence against that soul. So for example, when someone tries to stop the teachings from being given out or they pervert those teachings, they corrupt them, that's violence against nature. It's violence against the divine mother who's trying to save that soul. So this is very heavy. And you can see it's related to blind faith and it's related to fanaticism. Very similar. More questions? You had a second one? At our level, we look at the great masters with a kind of bewilderment. If you ever experience being in the presence of a really great master, it's a confusing experience. It's, um, hum it's, it's humbling, but also bewildering. It's hard to understand for us why they love us so much. 
why a master or an angel or a Buddha loves us so much and does so much for us. But it's precisely because they were in our shoes once and they understand our pain. Someone like Jesus, someone like Krishna, at a very high level of being, very high, was once down here like we are, making the same mistakes we're making. So similarly, when we see someone else performing wrong actions or suffering from their mistaken qualities, that gives compassion, right? We can, we can feel love for them and concern for them. This is good. It's what we need. We need to expand that. It's one of the benefits of studying these qualities in ourselves that help us understand others better. Little by little, we need to understand all of these so much and so deeply that they provoke incredible love in us. It seems like most of the time when students start to study this, there's a lot of resistance. You know, no, I don't have that. Maybe that one. <laughs> but not the other ones. And then when we encounter people with those qualities, we see, oh yeah, oh yeah, look at you. You've got so much pride. And we don't recognize that that was our pride pointing out their pride. Gradually, with honesty and humility and compassion, courage, love, we start to recognize all these qualities in ourselves, all these qualities in other people. And instead of making us a fanatic or a skeptic or angry, develop love, patience. There's an important passage from a scripture in this tradition that says that the chief virtue of the Gnostic church is compassion. Some translations say tolerance because they're translating from Spanish, but the word is actually compassion, which is what's implied there. Compassion, it is, in fact, the most important virtue. We've particularized it in the world of six laws because that's the world of causes, how, where the absolute is actually making that into a force that will act in the lower world. But compassion, if you could relate some term to the beingness of things, to the unity, the one law, that would be it. And that's why in Tantric Buddhism, they call that prajna. P-R-A-J-N-A. Which means the wisdom of the beyond. And what's implied in that is that profound love. We elaborate and develop that love by understanding all of this. And it's an odd thing. There are a lot of angels and Buddhas that are up in the heavenly worlds. And they are beautiful beings. There's no question. They're very beautiful, radiant, splendorous, and pure. But they have little compassion. They don't understand all this. The ones who passed through all these lower levels of being and then purified themselves of it and rose out again are on a completely different level of being from your average angel or Buddha. Totally different. They have a completely different quality of mind. We call it bodhicitta. And that term describes a quality of mind that understands all of this and wants to help those who suffer because of it and will give anything to help those people who are suffering. So that's a completely new type of mind. 
More questions? So most mornings when I get to try to meditate, I get assaulted by scenes of the same egos. I can see them and it's hard to not get the intellect involved in understanding them. But I feel limited that I can't get anywhere from it. Is it okay to just see these things and try to quiet them so I can develop concentration and then go deeper? As I see, this is probably related to the world of 40, 4,800 laws. Whatever we're experiencing, we have to observe it not avoid it. We have to see it for what it is and relax. The state of coming in and out of dreaming, sleeping, and coming in and out of meditation is particularly important for this. It's during that transitional phase, the consciousness is moving between levels of our psyche, that we can gain really tremendous insight into our situation. So as an example, when you're waking up in your bed and you're just starting to become aware of waking up, do not move. Try to maintain that transitional state and observe yourself. Don't open your eyes. Don't move at all. And try to extend your awareness back into the place you've just left. Relax into it and try to recover it. And with practice, that is going to aid your meditation practice a lot. And the way you can do this is that you have to not resist the imagery and the scenes that your mind is perceiving, the dream imagery or the voices that you hear, that sort of thing. You can't push it away and avoid it. And you also can't surge towards it. You have to be perfectly still, physically and psychologically and have the awareness active. In this way, you start to perceive and grasp and learn to manage that transitional state, learn to take advantage of it. Anyhow, to answer the question, no matter what you're experiencing, whether physically or internally, always be expanding your awareness. Even if what you're perceiving seems vague or uncertain or uncomfortable, don't avoid it. Don't turn away from it. Look at it. We sometimes say that how do I put that? Everything that's happening in you is part of you. We'll put it that way. It may not seem like it. You may see thoughts and voices and images that seem to have no purpose and not related to anything. But they're in you. There is something there. If your mind was already at these levels of being up here in the 24 or 12 laws, it would be empty. You wouldn't have all those voices. You wouldn't have those memories and the weird scenes and the dramas and tragedies that are playing out in your dreams all the time. None of that would be there. If you're still having weird dreams, or you're not remembering your dreams, your level of being is very low. It's down here. Someone who's raised their level of being, and first, as they raise it, they start to remember all of their dreams, everything. And little by little, the more pure all of this down here becomes, as they raise their level of being, they stop dreaming completely. It doesn't mean when they lay down that they completely lose awareness of themselves for eight to 10 hours. No, it means they lay down to sleep, they go out of the body and they are active out of the body the same way we are physically, but in the world of 24 laws or the world of 12 laws or the world of six laws, active, awake, aware, directing themselves by will, doing what they need to do. And then in the morning when they need to get, wake up, they go back in their body and they wake up. We're not there. We're not at that level of being. Don't lie to yourself and think that you are. You're not. The one who's at a high level of being knows it because they don't dream. They go out of their body at will and traverse those regions and do the work they need to do and then come back into the body and continue here. 
If you're not having that experience, you're not at that level of being. You're down here somewhere. Having all of this with your center of gravity drifting around between 96 and 480 or between 192 and 768 as you go to work, deal with all your frustrations there. You go home, deal with all your frustrations there. Your level of being is just drifting around in these regions with the subconscious, unconscious, and infraconscious qualities always trying to manipulate you and get you to behave in certain ways. That's our reality. Another question? Fanaticism and blind faith look almost the same. What's the, what's the difference there? Blind faith and what? And fanaticism. Fanaticism is where it's more like an intellectual quality. It's more conceptual. It has more to do with adopting a, polit a political idea or a religious idea or a scientific dogma and becoming a fan of that, attached and limited by that. Blind faith has more to do with what we were saying earlier about treason. Blind faith is more about having um, slavery to our own ego, being enslaved by the false sense of self. It would be easy to think that this blind faith has to do with like someone who's a Christian or a whatever type of religion, and that's all they accept. Dante used that as a symbol in his writings. He talked about blind faith in that way. But in ourselves, that is not a religious thing. It's psychological. We mistakenly believe in a sense of self that doesn't exist. Our I, our quality of being, who we think we are. We think we have these certain characteristics and we've had these experiences and we have these sufferings and we're all really attached to the sense of self that we've built. That's blind faith. That's why this leads directly to treason. Blind faith. You see, faith, the word faith means to have experienced, to know through direct knowledge. It doesn't mean belief. And when your faith is blind, it means your experience doesn't see the truth. And what is the root of our experience? In suffering, it's the ego. It is our ego, all of our defects, that we blindly believe and, and accept and, and express as our reality, our truth, when it's a lie, all of it. Our name, our history, our memories, our traumas, our pains that we love to sing about to others. We love to tell them how bad we were in college and how bad our father and mother were to us when we were growing up. And we're very proud of our sufferings and love to talk about all that. That's this. Our love for our false self. Question here? Remembering our being actively throughout the day, uh, whether it's like, you know, kind of use our imagination or I guess it would be like our mind consciously, like to remember, to remember, kind of hold that of like the Divine Mother or, you know, whatever our innermost something they give us, like that kind of connection and kind of gives us like some kind of uh, like superior emotions mm -hmm. to, you know, connect to divinity versus like, because, and sometimes it is just like that pure awareness and just like, like letting go, not attached, you know. Um, you know, sometimes throughout the day I've tried like like remembering like impermanence, you know, throughout the day, like the impermanence of the material world. And then also I guess in meditation, um, you know, like 
kind of a similar thing. Like so, sometimes like, you know, I try to just like observe the thoughts, you know, just like observe the thoughts and without being identified with them, without becoming like trapped in them, you know, like remembering that pure awareness, uh, I guess trying to like also, you know, meditate on egos that way or, um, and then other times, you know, I feel called to like meditate on like divinity or like, you know, contemplate like you know, impermanence or the absolute in meditation or like, you know, um, concentrate on the being in some way to like cultivate superior emotions and try to channel yep. superior, those if you're in a very emotional state, you know, it can be good to like try to cultivate a lot of superior emotions. I guess my question, if I could formulate it now, is can you talk about the difference between like that, just being that pure awareness and just like kind of letting everything go and just trying to like go beyond like every single thought and everything that comes into the mind versus like, you know, trying to work consciously with the mind and emotions in a positive manner and like contemplating like. Yeah, it's an important point. Let's look at these numbers. Look at this flow of density so you can see that down here things are very dense very complex these are the hell realms these worlds and this is our mind our quality of mind the higher you go up this list of numbers the simpler things become and the more pure and the closer to divinity our day-to-day -day existence we're drifting in these lower numbers the, the lower levels, rather, with the bigger numbers. And we have a lot of conflict and a lot of pain and a lot of uncertainty, and it's difficult to see which way is which, what's right, what's wrong, a lot of confusion. All different religions, including our tradition, give us a range of techniques to help us develop stability, a foundation that we can work from. We won't find it anywhere down here in any of this. In order for us to experience those higher worlds, we need to extract the consciousness from the confusion that it's trapped within. And sometimes that confusion is so great, we need help. So we use mantras. We use prayers. We invoke the help of superior levels of being in ourselves primarily. So, for example, when you're afflicted with strong temptation to do something that you know is wrong, but the desire is so strong that you are on the verge of committing a harmful act, we rely on the Lord's Prayer, Pater Noster, or other prayers, in order to invoke the help of our own being to give us the strength and the courage, the willpower to act right, to not fall into temptation to do the right thing, to pull the consciousness up. Self-observation does the same thing if you're doing it right. When you self-observe, you are also extracting your awareness out of this. Same when you meditate. When you meditate, if you meditate properly, you're extracting the consciousness out of all of this. Self-observation is simply to be aware. Self-remembering is for that awareness to sense the presence of divinity. Not this, not all the impurities in us, but to sense the purity that is trapped there, to sense the presence of something divine and pure. That's all that is. When you have the experience of self-remembering. It is a quality of being. It isn't a thought. It is a quality of experience to remember oneself, to remember the being. And when you feel that, you're pulled out of all this. It may be that you will experience this most dramatically and viscerally when you're out of your body. You may have the experience of dreaming and being in a very bad situation, under threat, or committing a harmful act. 
And suddenly, in that experience, you become aware of divinity. You feel that presence, a prayer calling from your heart, evoking the presence of divinity. And in that instant, you will come out of that experience. It will completely change because the consciousness is lifted out. The prayer, the same. The point is, learn to do it. Learn to do it by cultivating awareness from moment to moment and strengthening it, expanding it. The greater degree of awareness that you have the more you will rise out. Now this gets a little tricky because a criminal is aware of committing a crime, right? It is very simple and easy for any of us to develop awareness and remain filled with all these defects and act on them. And there are many who do. There are many in the world who develop awareness, meditation, very strongly, but they do nothing to eliminate their defects. And we should not fall into that trap. Simply becoming aware, simply learning to be more cognizant and more perceptive of things does not mean that you're eliminating your defects or coming out of those qualities. It's quite different. To eliminate them is something else entirely. The point being, the only way any of this is going to change is through learning to become aware of it and understand it. Any other questions? In here? No. Yes, ma'am. Oh, no. We can't change other people, unfortunately. Well, actually, fortunately, <laughs> right? This is important to recognize. Compassion is understanding and love. To be compassionate is to see someone suffering and, and feel empathy and want to help them. This is something different from change. If we were to try to change others, that would be this, tyranny. So I'll give you an example. I love my wife, but I cannot change her. And I have impulses that want to change her. You know, she has habits and behaviors that, in my opinion, she should not have. <laughs> But I cannot do that. For me to truly love her is for me to help her be what she wants to be. For her to follow her will. And in truth, this is exactly what divinity does with us, especially our own inner divinity. Remember we talked about our own inner divinity is that one law, the unity, which is a form of love that particularizes into these qualities up here these higher levels of being, compassion, willpower, etc. If our being demanded that we become pure, that we follow a religion and force that upon us, then it would not be an act of our own will, right? It would be imposed upon us by God. And in that case, there would be no purpose to our life. God would be a tyrant, not respecting our will, not respecting our interests, not allowing us to develop freely. That one law 
when it first particularizes is freedom. Freedom. Free will. This is the first manifested aspect of divinity. Total freedom. No limit, no law beyond that. That means that divinity at its root respects our free will. And behold, how much love God has, divinity has for us, our being, that our being allowed us to do all of this and make a mess of everything because that free will is so important for us to have, even though we suffer because of it. So in a similar way, in order for us to reach that level of being and become one with our being, that is the thing we most need to live by, to respect the will of everyone else, to not try to change anyone. So in the case of my wife, I have to let her do what she's going to do and always stop myself from even subtle ways of trying to change her mind, to try to change her behavior. Stop it. Just love her. Just love her. Give her everything I can to help her so she can become who she wants to become, whether for good or for bad. It's hard because I want her to be a certain way. She doesn't want to be that way. Yeah, this is precisely the balance. As an example, everything that happens in the lower worlds, so if we were to relate these laws back to places in nature, dimensions, let's say, all of everything that's happening in this outline, all of this is happening within these superior, more subtle levels, right? So. The worlds that I were describing as having a lot of laws are condensed very deeply in the middle of all of this. So everything that happens in here can only happen in here because of the environment that it happens within. Right? Yeah. This is a fascinating thing to understand. It's exactly where I'm going. Right. Right. Right, good question, important. Let's go back to Well, what I was getting at with my answer was that these levels, all the qualities that we're studying happen within that superior level. Everything that's happening down here is within the realm of these levels, right? Just more and more condensed. So anything that's happening in these levels is allowed by these higher levels. What we call karma, the, the force that balances all things, is particularized here in the world of six laws. Between 12, 6, and 3 is where we find those scales of nature. And that level of existence is managed by intelligences. We call them gods. So when we do prayers, when we're trying to help humanity, we're asking for those divinities to work those scales to help those who are suffering. 
whether it's a one person with an illness or it's a country that's at war. And we're praying, please, if it's possible, can we balance this somehow and re- relieve the suffering of those who are in pain? And all these beings that we see here around this Buddha symbolize those intelligences that are trying to do just that. And we, as aspirants to that path, who are trying to enter that path to help others, want to do the same. It is a very delicate balance. To know when an action helps and when it does not. It's extraordinarily difficult. Absolutely, it's possible. Precisely because we have all of this and we're not aware of it. We have all of these qualities in our mind that obscure our view. We're not aware of all this. We have subconscious, unconscious, and infraconscious qualities. We may feel physically precisely the answer. Precisely the answer. Only divinity can see. That's right. Jesus gave the example how to do it. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So when we pray, when we act, we always have to say, let thy will be done, not mine. I want to help. I'm saying this prayer to help this person. Let it be your will. Let it be according to the law of being. Karma. If it's not, it depends on the law. We may be asking for things that can't be done. Right? We may want a person to have healing, but it can't be done in accordance with the law. That person needs to suffer for their own good. Karma is a medicine that's applied to us to teach us. Karma is not punishment for the sake of punishment. They are all possible to dissolve once the debts are paid that created them. Everything that is in these realms is there because an action was performed that caused harm. That must be answered one way or another. It gives the capacity Unconditional love from divinity provides the opportunity to pay the debt. Is part of that. Sometimes, yes. Sometimes, for example, if we have a strong defect of gluttony that was taking and taking and taking and causing an imbalance in ourselves and in our environment, and we caused harm to ourselves and to some other situation, we caused a problem and we accrued a debt from that. We can pray all we want to be free of the debt that's causing pain, but that won't end until the debt is paid. If in meditation and in our practices, we fully understand that mistake, we see when we made it, how we made it, and the cost, the problem, the cause, the pain that it caused, and we really understand that, and we fully have remorse for that consciously. We say, I will never commit that mistake again. I feel so terrible about that. Then divinity says, you are forgiven. It's done. The debt is erased. Absolutely. Right. That's what the bodhisattvas do. They help others recognize those qualities in themselves that they need to eliminate. No one can take it away from you. When you've you've accrued a debt, it's yours, and only you can answer for it. The masters and the Christ sacrifice for our, you know, to help us recognize that, that the debt belongs to us. We performed the action. So it's like a criminal, like a justice system, right? All the criminals, all these qualities in us are in jail. 
That jail doesn't last forever. Each criminal has their sentence according to the severity of their crime. If the criminal continues to commit crimes, they're not going to get out, right? But if they recognize that mistaken action, they repent of it, they can get out early. But one way or the other, the term is, is uh, observed by nature. It doesn't last forever. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Unfortunately, now, you see how complex this is now? The laws. It's not simple. And all of these things, let me back up just one second and, and point something out. All of this is happening in our world right now. When we talk about this world of 672 laws, we're not talking about someplace else. It's right here. And so is the world of six laws. It's right here. We just don't see it. We're not aware of it. We're hazily aware of this law of 48, physical, physical things. But our world is heaving and shaking because there's so many laws locked in this battle and the gods are trying to keep it balanced before the thing shakes itself apart. So when we see it, for example, war, violence, places where there's a lot of suffering and a lot of destruction, yes, there are people who suffer there who shouldn't be. They're caught in the middle of this mess. And there are forces and entities that are trying to help them and get them out of harm's way. But things are very complicated. When there are 672 laws at motion, it's very complex, even for the gods to manage. Very hard. How do we help? Yes, this is precisely why we're studying all this, is that the gods need help. Prayer and learning right action. You also develop skill. When you start to actually extract consciousness from all of this and start to come out of the cage, you're also accumulating energy and the ability to concentrate that energy. And that's why we learn to use types of prayers and mantras in order to focus that energy to help other people. And there's a huge range of techniques. This is a really important thing to do. The main thing is that we learn to start sacrificing for others, to help others in whatever way we can. Sometimes that's supporting our local group. Sometimes that's through doing prayers and mantras. I know people that do these daily prayers and mantras to help other people, even people they don't know. It's a way to focus and help those who suffer because they have so much love for others. This is a very valuable thing to do. But the effect that we have is conditioned by what's allowed by the law and how much power we're able to direct, right? If most of our power is trapped here, we won't have much ability. Particularly if these qualities are still influencing what we're doing. So we know people that really mean well and do prayers to try to help others, but they're actually hurting them. It's very sad, but it's a very real thing that's happening daily. So we have to be really careful. When we do prayers, when we do mantras, when we're trying to help other people, we always have to pray in accordance with the will of God and in accordance with the law of karma, because we don't want to cause more problems than we're trying to solve. Another question here.
Absolutely. Slippery slope. <laughs> yeah, slippery slope. Okay, great question. When I'm talking about awareness, I'm trying to point towards what the whole book explains, which is to learn to be present from moment to moment in all circumstances, in all times. So throughout our daily life, to be in the present moment here and now, aware. And that awareness is primarily internal. Having some field of awareness of our environment is important because we are engaged with our environment. We need to manage that relationship carefully. But the more significant aspect of awareness, self-observation, is at our mind and our heart and our body so that we are cognizant from moment to moment as thoughts and emotions and impulses are surging inside of us trying to get us to act in different ways. That presence, if it becomes profound, draws our awareness out of these cages so that it can see them clearly. It's a simple thing to understand, but it's a, another thing to experience. When we are inside of our egotism, that we are right, and the way we see is the way things are. We don't see that for what it is. We just feel like it's our way of seeing things, and it's right, even though nobody agrees with us. <laughs> it's only when you're really self-observant that you can see that ugly thing for what it really is. So the reason I gave this lecture today was to help all of us start to see the relationship between these states of being and the laws that manage them. Because that egotism is heavy. 384 laws. It's very narrow. It's very rigid. It doesn't allow any other point of view. It only has its way or the highway. Right? It only allows that so when we observe that in ourselves, we need to recognize that, that narrow view. When we study the writings about meditation, there's always this passage. We need to be open to what is new, to seeing what is new. None of these levels can see what is new. None of them. They only can see what they want to see. So we need to learn to extract our awareness out from moment to moment and we'll feel it with these laws releasing from us. This is the most important thing I wanted to convey to you guys. You will feel this. When you're really self-observant, you will feel fewer laws on you. You will feel more serene, simpler, lighter. When you're in a state in these lower levels, you will feel conditioned, bound, limited. And you may think you are observing. I'm really angry, but I'm observing myself. You're not. If you're really angry, you're angry. 
That isn't your being. That isn't your innermost. That isn't your true nature. That's your anger, the defect. I'm getting a lot of warnings that we're over time now. So well, I've got a lot of one mores here. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, gosh. You have to have a raffle. In the back, you didn't ask anything. Excellent question. Perfect ending to this lecture. The word sacrifice, what does it mean? That word actually has a very deep meaning. But to understand it, we have to understand it in relation with all of this. When that light descends and creates all these worlds within us and around us, it is a sacrifice. It is how that light, out of love, manifests itself and gives us life. So we are alive and we exist because of a sort of cosmic sacrifice, you could say. When we're doing our work to change our situation and rise out of it, we also must sacrifice. And this has a lot of implications. Firstly, it's one of what we call three factors. Birth, death, and sacrifice. Birth means we need to bring ourselves to a point where these qualities our, our daily experience, our constant experience of things, how we act, how we live, how we are. These qualities are being born in us constantly and becoming more and more beautiful as they express themselves through us. And that has a lot of meanings, a lot of levels of meaning, how these virtues are born in our actions. Death is how all of these impurities die. As they die, as we are liberated from the cages that we're trapped in, birth is accelerated and increased. Every time that we destroy a mistaken quality of pride in us, humility is liberated. That death of pride is a sacrifice. We have to sacrifice our sense of self. So birth, death, and sacrifice are one thing. As a whole, that work, we're doing it because we're tired of pain, right? We don't want to suffer anymore. But we also don't want others to suffer. So we sacrifice all of our defects, all of our self-will, all of our mistaken ideas and beliefs for the good of ourselves and for the good of humanity. That's sacrifice. That's the meaning of all those religious symbols of the great gods dying. Jesus, Baldur, Quetzalcoatl, many others. It's a sacrifice of the lamb, we could say, in order to help humanity, in order to help others, in order to rise out of suffering. So alongside that constant self-observation, we also need sacrifice for others. Each time that we stop ourselves from acting in a mistaken way, we're sacrificing a desire. I want my wife to be a certain way. And when I stop myself, I'm sacrificing that. I'm sacrificing it for her. Because I don't want to be a tyrant. I don't want to make her something that she doesn't want to be. I don't want to manipulate her or coerce her or change her in a way that is against what her own being wants for her. I want her to become what she should become. And to do that, it's love. And I sacrifice my will to just help her become what she wants to become. Sacrifice has a lot of meanings. Yeah. And thank you. We'll stop there. <laughs>